I, <clears throat> I thought a little bit about this, uh, how when I got the invitation, how I would speak about Charles Taylor in relation to Canadian politics. And you know, I taught with Charles Taylor for 19 years at McGill. And it was a wonderful experience, a wonderful university, wonderful students, uh, wonderful colleagues. Uh, and we taught courses together at the undergraduate level and graduate level. So I think of this great man as a great teacher, greatest teacher I've certainly ever seen. And so I thought to myself, well, what has he taught Canadians, this great teacher? And I think he's given Canadians the greatest gift of all. And I'm going to try and just spell out the basics of it in 20 minutes. And the gift he's given us is a kind of language of Try a language of self-understanding of living in a deeply diverse federal democratic association like Canada. He's given us a way of seeing it, a way of talking about it, a way of cooperating together, a way of contesting uh, forms of misrecognition together. And he's put this uh, language together, this language of the lived experience to, of deep diversity, over the years, but I want to just pick out four of his main concepts and tell you a little bit about them, or at least my interpretation of them. And the first concept, of course, is deep diversity itself. The second is mutual recognition. The third is dialogue. The fourth is fusion of horizons. And these fit together, or my interpretation is, they fit together to form what we might call a way of reconciling our similarities and differences over time, over generations. So that's the story I'm going to tell. But I want to say it's not just an academic story. I would even say that insofar as Canadians have learned to cooperate together and to contest together nonviolently over the last 30 years, they've learned it by picking up, by the diffusion of this way of thinking about interacting as deeply diverse citizens in this very complex multicultural multinational society that we belong to in different ways. And it's the diffusion of Charles Taylor's way of thinking about these things that has helped us as fellow citizens to work our way through our differences and coordinate them in the interesting ways that we do in this crazy uh, country of ours. So the first concept is deep diversity. And there are two, two general types captured under that concept, multiculturalism and multinationalism. At the time Charles Taylor introduced this term, deep diversity, we were thinking of uh, diversity in Canada under one description or one mode of disclosure, and that's to say multiculturalism. And here we were mostly using what I might call third person uh, concepts picked up from the law, individual human rights, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, and a whole host of, my, of uh, minority rights. And these made up our language of multiculturalism. Now, Charles Taylor has no objection whatsoever to these. This is a profound feature of Canada. It's multiculturalism. But the language of the law is used to order these activities. But what we're trying to get at, I think, with the Taylorian language or approach is the actual phenomenology of us interacting together as multicultural citizens and the right language for that. And the right language is the language of deep diversity. And so, he had, if you like, two amendments to what was going on in the early 90s around multiculturalism. First, he switched from a third-person perspective to a first-person perspective. What kind of language do I use when I'm interacting with or in my everyday activities, culturally different Canadian? And what language would we use to talk about how we'd like to recognize each other in the grocery store or wherever we are, wherever we're engaging as fellow citizens? But second thing, and the big uh, revolutionary step he took, well, that was revolutionary enough, but the second one was this, that he said, look, there's a kind of diversity in Canada that doesn't get properly recognized under these multicultural categories. And these are people in, in Canada who belong to the Federation as a, whole, uh, as a whole, Canada as a whole, through belonging to a national community, through belonging to a nation or a people. And there's a quote here that's so famous, I just have to read it out one more time. And so here, here we go, where he's, he's bringing together these two types of diversity. To build a country for everyone, Canada would have to allow for a second level or deep diversity in which a plurality of ways of belonging would also be acknowledged and accepted. 
someone, here's the first level, someone of, say, Italian extraction in Toronto, Ukrainian extraction in Edmonton, might indeed feel Canadian as a bearer of individual rights in a multicultural mosaic. His or her belonging would not pass through some other community, although the ethnic identity might be very important to him or her in various ways. But this person might nevertheless accept that a Quebecois or a Cree or a Dene might belong in a very different way, that these persons were Canadian through being members of their national communities. Reciprocally, Quebecois, Cree, and Dene would accept the perfect legitimacy of the mosaic identity. So here's this classic quotation that's been read out in every uh, undergraduate class in Canada now for over 25 years, where we're talking now about Canada not just as a multicultural federation, but now as multicultural and multinational, having people with a sense of national belonging, of nationhood, or of peoplehood with a right of self-determination, and we include here Quebecois, and the First Nations of Canada, the indigenous people of Canada. And this is deep diversity because the, the national form of, sub subnational, if you like, form of belonging to the Federation is deep in the sense that these nations have their own form of government, they have their own legal orders, they have their own economic ways for indigenous people, very different ways of relating to the land, to the environment, uh, uh, way of relating to uh, settler Canadians. So the diversity and what counts as nationhood here ranges across Cree, Dene, Mohawk here in Montreal and so on. This is, the deep is meant to say, look, there are huge crisscrossing and overlapping types of diversity here, some of which can be captured perfectly well in the multicultural mo mosaic, but now another dimension or set of dimensions in which we have multinational modes of belonging that we have to make sense of, give due recognition to, and find ways of cooperation where we treat each other as equals. And the, the even more dense part of this is that the multicultural ways of belonging overlap and crisscross with the multinational. Quebecois, multicultural society, and so on. Dene have their own internal diversity and so on. So it's not as if there are two independent categories here, but crisscrossing and overlapping relations of dissimilarities and similarities that we have to think through from a first person perspective. So this came like a revolution, multicultural, multinational, or plurinational and intercultural here in Quebec. And it was picked up here in Quebec by Alain Gagnon, by Jocelyn McClure, by Guy Laforet, by uh, Dimitri Karmas, if he's here, and people began talking about Canada's multicultural, multinational. Jeremy Weber, uh, Mike Murphy went out to BC, David Cahane went to Alberta, Dominique here in uh, Quebec, and it be people began to talk this way. I think we we're very fortunate that Peter Russell at University of Toronto picked this up very quickly. And then uh, Joe Cairns, Melissa Williams, and so on. And people began to think, okay, how do we now think about belonging in this much more complex way? But at the same time, a group of young indigenous scholars said, okay, here's a settler Canadian that's giving us an opening so we can talk about our nationhood and our peoplehood in the way we want to, not quite in this multinational multicultural way. But we've been taken out of the multicultural box here, and we can give expression to our nationhood through our own traditions, our own ways of relating to others through treaties and so on. But we've got somebody here in non-Indigenous Canada who has opened a space for us. And this coincided with the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. And I, I think it's right to say that the, <clears throat> the Royal Commission couldn't have taught Canadians about this multinational country that the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples talks about without this introduction of deep diversity a couple of years before the Royal Commission got going. So I think it was a tremendous uh, revolution in the way Canadians and in the profound Canada, the indigenous Canada, began to see, wow, here's a whole new language in which we can feel at home in and talk about our modes of social suffering and how to overcome them, 
with better forms of recognition and redistribution. So that's our first concept, deep diversity, okay. Now, number two, I feel like Guy Laforet here last night. Okay, now, phase two. Uh, second concept is mutual recognition. And here I think when this concept of mutual recognition came out, we were still struggling under what we might call just non-mutual recognition, a kind of idea in Canada that we could solve all these modes of recognition, multicultural, multinational, through some high-level negotiations, mega-constitutional, high-level treaty negotiations with First Nations or constitutional amendment or a grand theory of uh, recognition and so on that could be then handed down to us, maybe by the courts or whatever. <clears throat> and that, I think, was the dominant view. But uh, Charles Taylor came along and said, look, recognition is mutual. It's something partners in an association have to work up themselves. There's this deeply democratic dimension to reaching uh, modes of mutual recognition that both partners can affirm from the first person perspective. And a high court or a constitutional team or a federal and provincial and elite uh, First Nation leaders negotiating somewhere in a hotel in Edmonton or Vancouver just doesn't work because you're not in on what's going on in the negotiations. So mutual recognition saved us from what we might call monological or unilateral record. Well, it didn't save us, so we went through a number of them, and they generated distrust rather than trust, because people couldn't understand what was coming out of these elite negotiations, because they weren't well integrated into the people who were, would be subject to them. So we got this second category that all recognition has to be mutual, and this was this deeply democratic turn that we as citizens are going to have to do this ourselves. This is, this is going to work as a federation. In some sense, we Canadians have to learn to talk to each other in a language that's mutually respectful. Okay, so that's the mutual recognition. So if deep diversity and if mutual recognition, not high court recognition, then how do we do it? And of course, the third concept is dialogue, which we've been talking a lot about for the last two days and lots of people here know more about the Taylorian view of dialogue than I do. And so I, I just want to run through what I think are three key features of this concept of dialogue, There's a lot, lots of dimensions to it. But again, we were, if I can make a contrast, and it's a little crude and a bit unfair, but I think we were working under a view that a democratic dialogue aimed at reaching agreement on a norm of action coordination that was independent of the diversity of the citizens that were engaged in the deliberative process, that it would be transcendent at the end of the day. Taylor gave us another way of thinking about dialogue, and I hear the three features, and I think they're all three are quite unique. The first one is that these dialogues are quite critical. When we enter in as fellow citizens in dialogues of this type, we bring our prejudgments about how we ought to recognize that other culturally or nationally different other person. We bring our sedimented or habitual forms of misrecognition into the space of public questioning. So it, it forces us to shake up our comprehensive doctrines a little bit here or our inherited ways of thinking about the other, an indigenous person or an anglophone thinking about a francophone or uh, thinking about an immigrant, it, asks, uh, it demands of us that we take this critical turn and call into question the structures of misrecognition that are the very cause of the struggles for recognition and put them into the space of questions. And this is difficult, and you'll remember in Gadamer, this is the third type of dialogue. There's no alternative. It's going to be a genuine dialogue. You have to bring that horizon of understanding into the space of questions. For indigenous people, that meant calling into question that whole stage's view of historical development that put them at somehow lower group that needed assistance and so on. Uh, and we talked a little bit about in, that in the first day. That m form of misrecognition has to pass into public discussion. Okay, so that's the critical dimension of these dialogues. The second one, where the, where how it differed from the standard dialogue at the time, was that it, it's oriented not in the first instance to reaching agreement at all, but to mutual understanding or mutual attunement. Richard Sennett just published a great book called Together, and he spends a lot of time uh, 
on this dimension. It's really well worth reading. So what you do in this dialogue, I mean, the standard dialogue, form of dialogue we had at the time, the mode of argument in public dialogue would be, each step in the dialogue would be more general, would get us more and more away from our differences and to some uh, uh, transcendent norm. In a mutual understanding, we often go in the opposite direction. We want to say, help me understand what's wrong with this way of recognizing you and what's, what are your strong reasons for wanting this other form of recognition. That's a very specific attention to a, a mode of social suffering that you just can't get at if your criteria of argumentation are each step in the argument has to be more general than the last one. And so it's dialogues of mutual understanding often go in the opposite direction. And this is true in truth and reconciliation commissions, or reasonable accommodation missions. You want to really understand the other and why this mode of recognition that's being imposed upon them is somehow causing social suffering that you quite often can't understand in your own categories, right? You might say, oh, that happened in the past, these residential schools, isn't that all over? Why are you still talking about them? Because it's in the present. It's a different type of temporality we're talking about here. And you, you get at that at a very specific type of dialogue, a dialogue of attentiveness, of deep listening. And so we call this kind of dialogue mutual understanding. So we understand our fellow citizens and where they're coming from, to use that great expression, right? And that's in the, in the diverse federalism, that's the kind of public dialogue you want to have, where we say, we don't stand at the sidelines, say these people are crazy. We say, you know, what's bugging you? What's wrong with this mode of recognition and so on? And we get the, a very specific answer. It doesn't help us with general norms of uh, action coordination, but that's not what we're aiming at. We're aiming at getting some mutual understanding of who we are in this very complex federation without too much uh, stereotyping and prejudicing and seeing the social suffering that underlies a lot of forms of uh, coercive uh, misrecognition. And it's out of those very specific dialogues that we begin to build up mutual understanding and we be begin a language of mutual understanding, which I'll come back to. Okay, the third feature of dialogue on this one is that it changes the people involved in it. There's a modality of self-transformation or self-change, probably everybody in this room knows this, as you go through it. If you sit down for a weekend with a group of Muslim women and ask them, what do you want in downtown Toronto or downtown Vancouver, you come out of it two days later with a very different understanding of who you are, what your country are and what it can do, and who these uh, religiously different people are. So the very powerful forms of self-change that takes place in these dialogues. I change, the person we're talking to changes, the, the demand for recognition that I entered in as I took the bow risk and went into these difficult uh, dialogues. Often I revise the form of recognition I wanted uh, by the end of the day. And so the thing is you have to, again, this is why it has to be mutual. You have to be in on it to be in on these changes that make us federal citizens through the course of the change in the dialogue. Okay, we're getting near the end. So the fourth uh, term now is, so three features of dialogue. The fourth term is this term, uh, fusion of horizon. Again, wonderful term, has all sorts of uses. But again, one, uh, one thing it does mean is fuse in the, fuses in clash, first sense, where I really do just provincialize my most sedimented modes of understanding how uh, I relate to my fellow citizens. I, it brings these into the space of questions like I mentioned earlier, like Chakrabarti says, provincializes my mode of disclosure of my fellow citizens and puts it into the space of question. It doesn't undermine it, but it just says, give us the reasons for that. And all of a sudden, I don't usually have to think about that in my habitual ways of acting. So it, it's critical in this, what Charles Taylor called yesterday, the unthought is brought into the space of reflexive and critical and comparative thought. And that whole modern stages view of historical development came in, for example, into the space of questions during the Royal Commission and throughout our schools in the uh, late 1990s and early 2000s, thanks to this step. So fusion of horizons, I was just trying to capture in this critical mutual understanding, self-change. 
But there are two results that come out of a fusion of horizons, which are fusion in, in Gadamer in another sense, he's using it here, and that you begin to piece together a language of comparison and contrast in which the partners you're dialoguing with understand each other. They begin to feel at home in this language, they begin to be able to cooperate in it, they begin to be able to contest in it, to bring in Bonnie Honig, another Canadian, we'll make sure we have a space for the agonistic Democrats here too. It's a language that we construct in the course of the dialogue. It's not a language that belongs to the hegemon or the dominant minority or majority. It's not a language that's handed to us by a court or by a political theorist. It's not the language of the subaltern. It's a language of the middle ground. It's the language of the, feder of the federation. It's the language we develop as fellow citizens interacting in everyday life and overcoming our misunderstandings. It's a language of, Jeremy's going to talk about this, perspicuous comparison and contrast. But my point about it is it's unique. It's the Canadian language of federalism, just like there's an Indian one, uh, Indonesian one, and so on. It's not a universal language. It's a language in which we, as each generation, learn to understand each other, where we're coming from, and how we can cooperate together while still affirming our uh, affirm-worthy uh, differences. So it's not a universal language, it's a Canadian language, if I put it that way. The second, the final thing about this uh, language that comes out of the dialogue is that that's the language in which we can reconcile our differences over time, in the courts, in business, on the ground, in everyday activities, in the public sphere, in parliament, and so on. We find these odd terms that only Canadians understand, Oates tests, and all sorts of things that no one know, no one else. You go to Europe and you talk, start talking like this, they don't know what we're talking about. But that's our language of civic education and civic conversation, which is built up from the ground up in this remarkable way. And so here, reconciliation is an ongoing process where each generation gets drawn into these types of dialogues and practices of dialogue and renegotiates this language over time. So it's an ongoing, not end state, view of uh, reconciliation. So that's what I'm calling a civic ethics. That is the greatest gift Charles Taylor has given to Canadian citizens. And I want to just, do I have time to mention yes, two quick points here? I mean, it's, it's a much longer paper, but. If I can just mention two things, you might say, isn't this utopian? Actually, that's the, after the quote, that's the sentence he, he says and begins the next paragraph, isn't this utopian? There are two reasons why this works. And the first thing is, when you're in on everyday dialogues of this type, you begin to learn about your interdependency. Not just mutual recognition, but mutual dependency you begin to realize that we're Canadian in virtue of all of us in this, and we can't be fully Canadian without all our fellow citizens and their differences. So it's a very, it's a, a, an insight that comes to you in a kind of second order awareness that, yeah, who I am and what I value is dependent on it gaining recognition from these other people who make up this very complex association. So you have this interesting awareness of a quite deep interdependency, or that at some basic level, there's something called federal being with, mitsen, that is just absolutely basic to who we are. And it, it may be, as Nancy says, partly constructed, or maybe just ontic, or maybe ontological <laughs> in some sense, but it's a kind of being with that you become aware of only if you enter into these dialogues. If you stay outside, you really don't understand the conversation and so on. <clears throat> but it's not just being with in that interdependent instrumental sense, it's being with the dimension of compassion or of mutual care. Care is an existential here, but it's a mutual care. You begin to realize, Charles Taylor in the Politics of Recognition says, you sense it as a need not just recognition amongst your own group, but a need for recognition uh, from the others, all affected, who are part of the association to which we belong. So it's being with, but it's also being with in a certain modality 
of caring for how I'm recognized by others, how I recognize others. And that's a deep truth about fe deeply diverse federal societies that actually work. And, and I think that can only be auto-generated through passing through this civic ethic that Charles Taylor has given us. So let's call it the federal fellow feeling. Thich Nhat Hanh calls it interbeing. If you're in on these, you mentioned Ahimsa yesterday, and a very interesting term, interbeing, which captures precisely what's going on here. But the second and final feature I want to mention, which is really interesting, these dialogues only work. You can negotiate as hard as you want and as many different fora as you want, but you have to negotiate in a particular way. You have to conduct yourself in a certain way. You have to manifest in your behavior as you're negotiating the very mode of mutual recognition and respect you want to bring about in the larger society. You have to embody the change you want to bring about in Canadian relations in this very dialogue. The dialogue has to be a manifestation of a successful mode of mutual recognition and respect. Or to put it another way, in Gandhi's formulation, you have to be the change. You have to, your, these dialogues aren't just, okay, that's something we do and we argue in any old way we want. The dialogues prefigure a better mode of relating together. So it's absolutely crucial what the normative force or power of dialogue, which people think is very weak, but it's actually very strong, is to see in front of you a person recognizing you as Quebecois and relate, relating and recognizing that way when they're negotiating and trying to work out a mode of cooperation or listening to a Cree in Cree ways and so on. It's that exemplarity of being the kind of mutual cooperative recognition that you're trying to bring about in the larger society in the way you comport yourself in everyday negotiations and exchanges, right? So the means here of making the change are the ends. They embody the mode of behavior we're aiming to bring about in the larger society. And that's to say your mode of engaging as a civic citizen is exemplary and that exemplarity has normative effects on the people you're discussing with. It builds trust, kind of federal trust. So I want to say in conclusion, if, if this interpretation is correct, that very civic ethic is something Charles Taylor embodies in his teaching, in his writing, in his public speaking, in his reasonable accommodation, the way he comported himself in the fora. He embodies this uh, federal civic ethic of relating to others in the way they want to be related and recognized, of bringing forth, asking people what's really driving you and where are you coming from. All the features of it I've tried to mention are manifest in the behavior of this great teacher in the classroom and uh, in public life. So thank you. Thank you.